Come on, would you give our God a praise this morning? We thank you, Lord. Would you remain standing just for one moment? I want to share a message with you today that I'm calling, I'm honing my craft. Would you look at your neighbor and say, I'm honing my craft. Look at the neighbor on the other side and say, I don't even, I'm not even sure what that means. But I'm honing my craft. You know, there are so many people who are struggling today, not because they don't have what it takes. And it's not because they don't have the ability, but because they're unwilling to hone their craft. They're unwilling to sharpen their skills. They're unwilling to take the time to develop what they already have. And they're frustrated because they don't seem to be making any forward progress. Can I hear you say, I'm honing my craft? Would you join with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we need you this morning. This is your church. We are your people. And we have gathered in the name of Jesus to give you honor, to give you praise, but it doesn't stop there because we want to hear the instruction from your word. We want to hear direction from your preached word. We want to change from the inside out, because, not because we experienced an experience, but because we were in the presence of a holy God. And so this morning, Lord, we pray that we wouldn't leave this place the same as we walked in, but that we would leave a new man, we would leave a new woman because we were in the presence of a holy God. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Would you put your hands together for Jesus again? Come on. As you're being seated, nudge someone, nudge someone. Say, I'm so glad you came to church today. Wouldn't have been the same without you. So glad you came to church today. I'm honing my craft. I'm, ho I'm hoping that you're honing your craft. And if not, hopefully uh, the trajectory of your life will change because of what you, what you encounter this morning. I was told a story about two lumberjacks. And they were out in the woods chopping. They were chopping down trees. Isn't that what lumberjacks do? I think that's what they do. Lumberjack. Okay. And so they were out chopping down trees and one one of the lumberjacks one of the guys looked over at the other and said I, I need to take off I need to go take a break I need to go sharpen my axe and the other one spoke up and said yeah I don't have time to do that there's too much work to be done there's so much that needs to be done so he just kept chopping and chopping away at those trees and so the first man he, he went he went and sharpened his axe and when he came back about three hours later he ended up chopping down twice as many trees as the man with the dull ax, and he did it in half the time. Can I hear someone say, I'm honing, my craft. I'm honing my craft? King Solomon, in his time, he was the wisest man who had ever lived up to that time. And he wrote in Ecclesiastes, the 10th chapter, the 10th verse, he says, if the ax is dull, if the ax is what? If the ax is dull, by the way, you sound good this morning. You sound great. Keep it up. You're looking, you're looking good too. He says, if the ax is dull and its edge unsharpened, if the ax is dull, it, it, it's ed if you touch the edge, it's not going to have any bite. It, your, your thumb is just going to smooth over it. If the ax is dull and its edge unsharpened, it hasn't been honed yet. He says that more strength is needed. He says that more work is needed, more effort is needed, more energy, more resources, and more time is needed. And he attributes this and he begins to, he, he, he compares and contrasts this to skill and success because he says, but skill will bring Success. Can I hear someone say skill will bring, go ahead and put that next part up, but skill will bring success. Let me hear you say that. Skill will bring success. Honing your craft, sharpening your skill, developing what you already have is going to bring <laughs> success. And you may be discouraged right now because you have some things that you, you know you have what it takes. You know you have this ability 
but you just haven't yet taken it out of the closet yet and dusted it off, chiseled off the rust and began to use it so that it can be developed, so that it can be honed, so that it can be bl a blessing uh, to the people around you. So my boys have been playing Little League Baseball for a couple years now. And as the years go on, the competition, it naturally progresses. The skill level, it naturally increases as the, the kids get older, as they gain a greater understanding of, of the game. Uh, but as a father, last year, something began to concern me. It began to bother me uh, because my oldest son, Lyric, instead of progressing, it seemed like he was getting worse. He wasn't even just staying the same. He was getting worse. And as a parent, as a father, and also as his assistant coach, I was, I was becoming concerned. What, what's going on here? What, what could be, you know, at first you just kind of observe. You don't say much. Um, you know, I'm not going to tell him, like, what, what's wrong, son? Snap to it. I need to figure out for myself because he's, he's eight years old. Right. He has no clue what's going on. And so he needs his daddy to take a look, to observe and see, okay, what's, what's going on? What, what could possibly be going on? So he wasn't progressing. He was getting worse. He wasn't hitting the ball like he, he was in the previous year. He wasn't catching the ball or throwing the ball on par with some of the other kids. And so I began to take notice of this. And, and so as one of his assistant coaches, I began to coach him and instruct him on how to improve his skill, how to hit, how to catch, how to throw better. And guess what? Nothing changed. Nothing changed. What did you think I was going to say? You thought it was going to be a happy ending. Sorry, that's it. We're done. Let's go. No, nothing changed. And I could tell he was getting frustrated. I was getting frustrated. He didn't know I was getting frustrated. But he was getting frustrated. I could tell. He, he, he knew he had this ability. He knew because last year and the year before, he was smacking the ball. He was improving. But this year, something, something happened. He was getting frustrated. And so when he was up to, up to bat, I'd be at the first base, you know, first base coach. Come on, kiddo. You got what it takes. You can do it. Come on, swing that bat level. Come on, ducks on a pond. And he had no idea what I was talking about. I don't even think I know what I'm saying when I'm saying that. But it wasn't until, until Felicia and I realized that, hey, this boy is growing and he's growing fast. He's growing like a weed. And he's not slowing down. Maybe, just maybe, he's not comfortable in his rapidly growing body. Maybe he's struggling because he feels awkward in his own skin and bones. And, and since his limbs are growing so fast, maybe I need to spend some extra time honing his skill. Maybe I need to spend some extra time helping him to get used to what it feels like to swing a bat with longer arms. What it feels like to catch the ball with longer arms and throw the ball with longer arms because he was feeling kind of like loppy and <laughs> feeling awkward. So that week, Felicia and I, we, we invested some time, we invested some money on some equipment to begin to hone his baseball skill at home. And I spent some extra time with him uh, sharpening his skill when it came to hitting, when it came to catching, when it came to throwing. And guess what? <laughs> Someone say it worked. It, it worked. That little extra time, that little extra money from someone who cared enough, it amounted to a result that couldn't have been purchased with any amount of money. Because the very next game, Lyric ended up hitting the ball all the way out into the outfield. And you, as you can imagine, the, the heart of his father exploded all over that field because this is what happened. He hit the ball. He hit it far enough to where we're, we tell him, keep going, keep going. So he rounds first base. And when he gets all the way to second base, he stands there and he, he pulls this move, this number. He says, yes. But it didn't stop there because he said something else. He said, finally. He knew he had something, but he wasn't able 
to bring it to fruition. He wasn't able to, to, to see it manifested. But when it finally was there, it didn't happen on accident. It didn't happen by, by happenstance. But it happened because he was intentional about honing his craft. He was intentional about honing his skill and what he knew he had finally happened. And as a dad, man, my guts were all over that field. Man, you couldn't tell. I was coach mode. <laughs> but I was so happy, oh my goodness, on the inside. I was definitely tearing up and I was so thankful. And you don't know those things until you have a child, right? You can, I can tell you this, and people have told me for years what, what it's like, but you don't know until it actually happens to you. And I, I'm so thankful that we, we found out uh, and began to hone in on, on his craft and being able to get him to the place that he needed to be to begin to, to, begin to pr progress. Can I hear someone say, I'm honing my craft? And so why would I tell you something like this? Is it so I can brag about my kid? Of course it is. No, it's not. Absolutely not. It's to illustrate to somebody today that the reason why you might be so frustrated is because you're sitting on a potential that isn't being developed. You're sitting on a gold mine that God just, bloop, just gave to you. And you're just sitting on it. Instead of sharpening your skill, you're allowing it to collect dust and rust. Instead of developing and perfecting your ability, you're allowing what other people say and what other people might think about it to keep you from being everything that God created you to be. Are you with me this morning? This is a great word this morning. This is a great word. You see, to hone something is to sharpen it. It's to refine or to perfect something over a period of time. It's a process. Can I hear you say it's a process? It's a process. You might want things to happen overnight, but many times it won't happen overnight. Just imagine how silly you would think I was if I planted a seed and expected it to grow by the time we left here today, or even by next week to have it fully grow and producing fruit. No, you'd say pastors like fell off his rocker. It's a process. It's something that happens over time. And so you might be in a relationship that you have been neglecting for the past 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years. And you come to Christ and say, Lord, help me. Thinking that he's just going to overnight, all of a sudden, done. No. What God is going to do, he's going to give you peace in the midst of the storm. He's going to give you direction on what to do, how to do it, and where to go. But it's up to you. To do that part, to, to take the steps, to do the hard part and say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. You know how hard that is? I'm talking to humans. I know you know how hard it is. And sometimes it could be one of the most difficult things to do, but sometimes that's the first step, even when you're not wrong, to be a peacemaker. And if you want to get to that second step, sometimes you have to do something that, that is kind of difficult to do. Sometimes you have to take the first step, but it's a process. It's not typically something that happens overnight. And there are so many people going through life frustrated because they're unwilling to hone and to sharpen the very things that they already have. You see a husband and a wife who are struggling to have children, and I, and I know this is a sensitive subject, and, and so I'm gonna walk lightly and know that I'm with you, the church is with you. Um, but also at the same time, we have, um, we've had uh, some, some couples come into the church who weren't able to have children, who have children now and are trying to put, pump the brakes. 
because, because they now, before it was a thing where the doctors were saying, you're not going to have children, and if you do, it's going to be difficult. But now they have multiple children because God has blessed them. But what, I want to I bring some encouragement to you this, this morning. You see, a husband and a wife who are struggling to have children can become so focused on what they don't have and become so frustrated that they begin to forget what they already have. And if they're not careful, they can begin to neglect and possibly even begin to resent the very thing that is already in their hands. Hone your craft. Love on each other. Continue to pursue each other, especially through the most difficult times. Parents, our children aren't going to just magically fall into line and respect authority. Can I get an amen? amen. And I'm a great example of that, but we're not going to get into it. <laughs> Today, at least. Our children aren't going to just automatically follow the rules and be honest and truthful, even though we'd love for them to do that. It's not something that they just naturally fall in line with. If, if, if anything, they're probably going to do just the opposite. They're going to push the boundaries. They're going to try our patience. They're going to see where we stand, and they're going to test to see how much we're going to allow them to cross the line. And if your kids are anything like me, I mean, like my children, <laughs> you tell them where the line is, and they look around, they, they tow it. No alarms went off, no bells, no whistles. Let's put the whole foot in. Leaning over. I'm just doing exercises. What are you talking about? No bells, no whistles. Now we're all the way in. They're testing the boundaries. They're testing how serious you were when you said no or when you said yes. You said we were going to 7 Eleven to get Slurpees after school. Well, I know what I said. Priorities. And so they're going to toe the line. They're going to they're gonna test the boundaries. But it's up to us as parents to hone and to sharpen, to develop our own children. Did I say that out loud? Did I say our own children? Yeah, that's what I meant. Our own children. We can't leave it up to the school. We can't leave it, especially can't leave it up to social media. We can't leave it up to Nickelodeon or Sesame Street. I don't have anything wrong with them, but... We can't leave it up to them. But honing and sharpening and developing our children begins at home. It doesn't begin at church either. Right. So what the church is here to do for parents is to partner with parents and to, to, to um, support what you've already been teaching them at home. Right. And so they're going to be following because ultimately they're not going to follow what they learned at church. Most likely they're going to follow what they learned at home. And so if, if we're teaching them at home the, the love of Christ, that this is what I, this is what I do with, with my, my boys uh, daily when we're going to school. I say, hey, Lyric, what's your last name? He'll say Myers. Before it was like he didn't know what was going on, but now he knows. And I say, well, what does that mean? And they'll say, it means that we love God and we love people. That's what we're about. That's what we're about. So on the way to school, we'll pray. And we'll let them pray. We don't pray for them. They, they, they pray and they lead each other in prayer. They, they, they uh, go back and forth each day. And then I'll ask Lucas, Lucas, what's your last name? And so for the longest time, and I think they still think this. So if you ask them, they think that Myers actually means wow. that we love God and we love people. So we'll, we'll straighten that out in time. But we are to develop our children at home, and it starts at home. It starts with being, being um, consistent and intentional with the things that we say. We don't threaten our kids, but we tell them if we say something, we mean it. And if I said it, that's what I mean. And, and, and I have to, to do what, what I said. I've got to be a, a man. I've got to be a woman of my word. My, my word is my bond. And we teach them at a young age because if they grow up, anyway, you know what I'm saying. You, you know where I'm at. <clears throat> and so it's, it's up to us. And, and the, the best and most valuable resource that we can give our children is our time. There's nothing more valuable than your time. You can't, there's nothing 
more expensive, more value that is greater than the time that you spend with your children. And I know you know this, you're a smart group. Um, And the best and most valuable direction that we can point them in is when we point them to a personal and saving relationship through Jesus Christ. And that starts at home. And man, we have a great Joy Kids program that is going, going on weekly that they're, they're partnering with our parents and teaching the children of, uh, the love of Christ, about the love of Christ, who Jesus is, who he was, and, uh, and who he is to them today and on their level. And I, and I just love hearing from my boys when they come home uh, what they're learning. And I'll, and I'll test them. Test your children. See what they've learned. And so as you hone a blade, you're sharpening that blade. You're knocking off and you're removing all the rough edges that are causing resistance. As you hone a blade, you're straightening that blade and you're making it smooth so that it'll become more efficient. As you hone and perfect a blade, you'll notice that it begins to cut with more precision. It begins to cut with more accuracy, with more efficiency. And when you begin to cut with that perfected blade, it takes less effort less strength, and you get the job done in half the time. Can I hear someone say, I'm honing my craft? craft. And so from the University of Rochester Medical Center Health Encyclopedia, it's a mouthful, they say, and this is a quote, a dull blade is actually more dangerous to use than one that is sharp. Here's why. A dull blade requires more pressure to cut increasing the chance that the knife will slip with great force behind it. A sharp knife, on the other hand, it bites the surface more readily, becoming more efficient, more effective. And so we get back to Ecclesiastes, the 10th chapter, the 10th verse, where King Solomon, he said, if the ax is dull and its edge unsharpened, more strength is needed more time, more power, more effort, more resources are needed, but skill will bring success. I love this. I love it. You see, to hone your craft, it implies that there's a process that's going on that is taking place over a period of time. And you'll notice this will take, t- 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 uh, it'll take place in our relationships. And so we can't expect that if I've been doing something um, or if I've been neglecting something for, for umpteen years, that overnight it's going to just change. Or if I've been developing habits over a length of time that all of a sudden overnight, and believe me, I know that God can do anything. And so, yes, he can take that desire away from you overnight. But does that typically happen? No. No. Can it happen? Yes. Does it happen? Yes. But most of the time, it takes time. It's a process. Um, And sometimes it's something that we've learned as a child that we've brought through our teenage years, through our college years, and up through our young adult years and into our adult years. And we're still struggling with something that we were struggling with as a child. So sometimes you'll need, part of the process will be going to seek, seek professional counseling. I believe that helps so many people. And so we've just got to be be ready to to know what part of the process we're in and to to be led by the Holy Spirit, the, the, the part of God who is living on the inside of us, leading us, guiding and directing us and being sensitive to his direction and where he wants us to go. So I've I've seen many people in their walk with God. They'll get saved, they'll give their life to Jesus. It's the best thing that ever happened to them in their life. They were going the same direction for so many years. They didn't know if they would ever find peace. They didn't know if they'd ever find joy. They didn't know if they'd ever find anything that was good. Then they walk through the doors and as they're walking through the doors, they will tell me that when, as I walk into this place, tears just begin to roll down my eyes because I knew I was in the place where I needed to be. I felt the presence of God. It wasn't because we're cool. Wouldn't that be cool? but it's because the Holy Spirit is present. And I want you to know with everything within me that I depend on the Holy Spirit more than anything or anyone else. 
Without him, I'm lost. Without him, I'm undone. Without him, I go back to where I used to be, and I don't want to go there. But so many people will come into the church. They'll get from God what they need, but then, so salvation is instant. The quickest prayer, fastest prayer will ever be answered. Lord, I put my faith in Jesus Christ. He's the, he's the Lord of my life. I know I'm a sinner. Forgive me of all my sin. <laughs> Boom, saved, right. forgiven, if it was from your heart. And only, only, that's between you and God. I can't tell from the outside looking, in, like, you know what I mean? Right. I, I don't know if you're actually saved, but that's not my problem. Right. That's not, I'm here to support you. And so they'll, they'll, they'll get saved, that instant then that happens instantly, a gift from God. Can't buy it, can't earn it. But then the process begins. And it's the big Bible word that we call sanctification. It's the process where we partner with God as he begins to hone us, as he begins to sharpen us, as he begins to mature us, as he begins to develop us. And that all happens through the word of God. That's the standard. We don't have a bunch of standards. We don't have 15 standards that we line up and say, okay, this, this is the standard we're gonna use today. We have one standard and that is the word of God. Can I hear an amen? amen? So that we're not confused. We all go to the same place. Jesus followers all around the world. We, we call them brothers and sisters in Christ because we all believe in the same spirit, the same baptism, the same church. We're all un, united in one. And so they'll, be, they'll get into this process and they'll start getting discouraged because it's not happening the way they thought it should happen in the time that it should happen. But if I'm being honest with you, church, this process, sometimes it'll last, well, let me, let me, let me back up. It lasts a lifetime. There are certain things that we will go, that be in the process that will, will be honed and kind of perfected um, as we go along. But ultimately, this perfecting, this honing, this sharpening, this developing, this maturing, it's a lifetime process that we will always be in. As your pastor, I will always, you better pray that I'm always in this, um, in this process. Uh, uh, in this humble state where I know who God is and I know how limited and how frail and how fault, faulted I am and how I'm, I'm so easily prone to follow the wrong path because of my human nature, the human nature to sin. And so, so that's why I say I need the Holy Spirit and that's not just for a pastor, that's for every Jesus follower because I'm not a pastor first, I'm a Jesus follower first. And for every single one of us, we are Jesus followers. And so getting back to this person who's getting frustrated, eventually, because it doesn't happen when they want it, how they want it, in the time that they want it, they end up leaving and you never see them again. And how, how uh, sad that is for, for us as a church when we see someone come through those doors and we, we embrace them with, with loving arms, loving when it's least deserved, loving when it's least expected. And they come in and they, they meet Jesus. Not only hear about him, but they meet him face to face. Ah, this is so good. And they end up walking away because they didn't realize that it was a process or what the process was supposed to look like. And I, I'm telling you this morning to encourage you to realize that this is a process that you'll be involved with, with the rest of your life. And it's a good thing. Okay. Thank you, Lord, because if you're still honing me, that means you still love me because you wouldn't touch something that you didn't love. You wouldn't sharpen or hone something or perfect something that you didn't love. But you loved me so much 2,000 years ago that you gave your son as the ultimate sacrifice so that if I would put my faith in him, I would, I would not perish, but I would have everlasting life. I would be forgiven. I would be put in a right standing with God. And so this is, the, this is what we've got to hold on to it, during the process, along the way, and to encourage each other as the day uh, approaches, as the day gets closer and closer, that Jesus comes back again to take his bride. Are you with me this morning? I can get excited. So as you hone 
your craft, as you develop your skill, as you continue to cultivate your relationships, as you make progress in overcoming addiction, as you begin to replace the past 25 years of bad habits with good ones and much better ones, it's gonna take time. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm, I'm honing my craft. You're gonna feel like giving up. Can I prophesy over you? You're gonna feel like giving up, I promise you. I'm guaranteeing that. You're gonna feel like giving up. You're gonna feel like quitting, but that will be the worst thing that you will ever do. And one of, one of the verses that, that I go back to is the writings of Paul. I believe it's in Galatians when he says, don't be weary in well-doing. Don't allow yourself to get tired of doing what is right. Even though it doesn't feel good at the moment, it doesn't feel like you're going in the, in the right direction. Sometimes it feels icky. Don't get tired of doing what's right. Don't get tired of following Jesus. Don't, get, don't be tired of serving and loving God and loving people. You see, as humans, we cannot, we cannot help but to have emotions and to have feelings. It's just going to happen. You can't get away with that. But we do have control over whether or not we follow those feelings and whether or not we're going to allow ourselves to be offended. Because to follow a feeling is as, as, about, as wise as, as putting your hand in a hornet's nest. I don't know if you've ever done it before. No. Don't do it. Because you're going to get stung. You're going to get stung. Because your feelings and your emotions have no idea what you need. If you're anything like me, your feelings and your emotions, they fluctuate from day to day and sometimes even moment to moment. And we see in Psalm 119, 165. We see the psalmist says here, great peace. What kind of peace? Great peace. Not just peace, but great peace. The peace that comes from God that surpasses all understanding. Great peace have they who love your law, God. And nothing shall offend them or make them or cause them to stumble. Let me read that again. Let, let this soak in. Let this be an encouragement to you. Let this be something that you memorize and you quote to yourself daily when you, when you want to get mad at your spouse or you want to get upset or offended at your children or offended at your mom or your dad or offended at whoever, your pastor. You, know, you want to get offended. Great peace have they who love your law because when we understand, when we know, and when we love the law of God, we understand where, 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 we, where we stand with God. And no matter what anyone says or does to me, it does not supersede what God has already said about me and how he thinks about me and who he created me to be. So I'm not gonna allow anyone or anything says here, nothing shall offend them or make them or cause them to stumble. You see, it's up to us. It's up to me. It's up to you to hone your craft. It's up to us to discover the very things that God has given to us and to be good stewards over those things and to sharpen them and to develop them intentionally over time. And the primary reason that God gave us these things was not so that we can become a millionaire or so that we could gain recognition. But the primary reason is so that we would have an impact and that we would be an influence for the kingdom of God and for the name of Jesus in whatever industry that you're a part of. Can I hear an amen? Amen. And so if you are, if you are a Jesus follower and you do become a millionaire, and you do get recognition, you'll use it to have an even greater impact and to be an even greater influence for the name of Jesus and for his kingdom. Amen. Praise God. I want to give you a nugget as we're, as we're closing here. While skills, talents, and ability may be built into our DNA, Those skills must be honed. They've got to be sharpened. They've got to be developed in order to be a benefit to others. While skills, talent, and ability may be built into our DNA, these are the very things that must be honed 
sharpened, developed in order to be a benefit to others. You see, there are so many talented and well-skilled people in the church, in the church, in this church, but they may never know because their skill is still in the closet collecting dust. And I truly believe that there are people who are depending on us to hone the craft that God has given to us. You see, Jesus could have said, I love you and just left it at that. He could have, he's God, he can do whatever he wants. But just like honing a craft, his love would require an action. His love would require of him to step down from off of his throne to become like one of us and to give himself completely. You see, when a person puts their faith in Jesus, they are instantly forgiven. They are instantly put in right standing with God through Jesus Christ. But what immediately follows is a process where God, through the Holy Spirit, begins to perfect us from the inside out. He begins to sharpen us. He begins to develop us. Not so that we could be saved, because that's already, that's already happened, but so that now and through the process, we will have an impact and an influence on the world and the people around us so that they too can have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. Can I hear an amen? amen. Would you stand with me all across this congregation? Would you put your hands together for Jesus? We thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord.